everybody, and welcome to Story Church. Whether you are joining us in person or online, we are so glad that you are here, and we hope you are enjoying this amazing series on mental health. I'm here to just share a few quick announcements with you, and the first is that this month, on May 29th, we have a fifth Sunday. Woo woo! That means that we are not going to be meeting here in East Ridge Middle School that Sunday for service. We're going to be out in the community doing outreach, serving our community, and getting to know people. We are so, so excited about this. The um, details of that will be announced very soon. The next event that we have going on is our dinner party on Friday, June 10th at 5.30 to 7 at the Central Florida Hope Center. This is like our next steps class. It's where if you are new and are just engaging in the church or you haven't been yet and you want to go, you can ask us the pastor's questions, get to know us. We can get to know you and see where you could possibly plug in. We're going to have some awesome food and child care and we would love to see you there. So the last thing is, if you're a guest or a returning guest, we'd love for you to fill out a connection card. We just want to say thank you, send you a gift in the mail, and let you know that we are so happy that you would choose to spend your Sunday with us and get to know us a little bit. We will not bother you, but we would love to just reach out and say hello. So we hope you enjoyed the service. Have a great one. All right, all right. Woo-hoo. Lots of stuff coming. Lots of stuff coming. We're excited. So many Sundays in in May. I feel like we've been in May for forever, but we still got two more to go even after this. (laughs) It's exciting. We get to close out the month by serving our community, so that's exciting. I think that's going to going to be an impactful one. We're, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but we are going to be serving here locally in Claremont. And so, um, yeah, we love, we love to do that. That's one of our core values. We believe at Story Church that you should always choose others, um, even sometimes prior to choosing yourself. I know that sounds really, really counter, countercultural, right? Like before you choose yourself, sometimes you should choose others. And we've been in a mental health series, and one of the number one ways you can actually overcome things that you're dealing with in a mental health aspect is to serve, is to serve other people outside of yourself. And not just those that you're close to, those that are typically in a, in a situation that's worse off than you. God will soften your heart and let you see sometimes that, man, what I'm walking through may not be everything I've made it out to be. Yeah, sometimes it's cool the way God designed us. Sometimes it energizes you, you know, serving other people. And it's like, oh, I don't know if I want to get up and do that. And, you know, or it's going to be hard or uncomfortable. But I've never, like, left either a mission trip or a serve outreach or something in the community and been like, oh, man, that was exhausting. Don't want to do that again. You always leave it, even if you're feeling tired, like, oh, my gosh, that was so great. Like, I can't, like, believe it. Like, we got the opportunity. A few of our team went to the Mobile Hope Center. Um, last uh, yesterday and so we got to like work a bunch of tables Trish and I were at the kids bounce house (laughs) we got to do that and Rich and Spencer got to do counseling pray for people and um, invite them to church and stuff like that and it was so fun to just be out in the community even though it was hot it was so fun to be doing that so um, that was an awesome opportunity uh, to do some outreach too. Yep, yep. And so we will have in the next few weeks some more exciting news about our hybrid schedule. We're going to be doing something a little bit different over the summer. And so I just want you guys to be on the lookout for that. We will still be meeting in person, but it's going to look a little bit different when we do. And then we're also going to be adding some extra outreach opportunities in there as well. So just be on the lookout for that schedule change. We will email, text, call, yell at you, um, everything you, you need so you know exactly what's going on. I'm just kidding. Um, so when we when we preach together, sometimes we're uh, a little bit back and forth, but it's okay. So we're in part three of a series called Out of the Cave. It's called Rebuilding Our Emotional House. Um, last week, we talked about what Elijah, for those of you that weren't here, we talked about what Elijah did that we also do to get ourselves into the cave. And for the last few weeks, I've also had up here a book or a resource that we've been pulling a lot of this from. If you haven't picked it up, I strongly suggest picking up Pastor Chris Hodges' Out of the Cave book. It is phenomenal. It's very helpful when it comes to this stuff, and especially if you know someone who is in a cave mentally, emotionally, um, it's very helpful. And so he looks at several factors that can be red flags that we may be headed towards depression, 
but also what we are able to do about them. A crisis inevitably reveals <clears throat> our emotional capacity and our character. We have all at times been blindsided by circumstances that leave us in the cave of depression. That is why strengthening the foundation of our emotional house is so important. When faith in Christ is our bedrock foundation, we are ready when, when life's storms hit. How many of you have a storm you're walking through right now in some form or fashion? Could be physically, could be in your job, it could be emotionally. Most of us are walking through some kind of storm right now. And so, and we talked about too, it can be like coming off a high or a low, like usually it's one or the other, like it's the opposite, like it'll be something really, really good will happen and then we'll get to feeling like that or sometimes it's, you know, something really, really low. Yeah, and you can have them both in the same exact day, right? You could have some really good things happen and some really bad things happen and then you're just like, I don't know what, what is going on with my life, what should I do next? So we're going to jump into the Bible. I I believe that we should always look at God's word for anything in our world, but especially things that are really tough to get through, walk through. We should see how God handles it in Scripture. So I'm going to read 1 Kings 19, verses 5 through 9. It'll be on the screen behind me, as well as if you have it in, in your own phone or in a Bible right there with you, that would be very helpful. It says, Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. How many of y'all are hungry right now? Y'all got some of the manna donut king from the (laughs) Lord this morning? Um, He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank the Texas Roadhouse and then lay down again. The angel, oh, it doesn't say that? I'm sorry. (laughs) The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat that Chick-fil-A, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights. I don't know about you guys, but 40 days and 40 nights, that's a, that takes place a lot of times in Scripture. There's got to be something significant there. Um, 40 years. Yeah, 40, 40 years 40, in the uh-huh. wilderness, like that number 40. And until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God, there he went into a cave and spent the night. So I'm going to go ahead and pray. We're going to jump into some things here and see what the Word has for us. Dear Lord, I thank you for every person in here. God, I thank you for every person watching online. I know there's been many yes, watching throughout you, this Lord. series. God, we just declare your goodness, God. We declare that where there's um, anxiety and depression, God, that it would have to flee at the name of Jesus. So right now, we just speak Jesus over every situation. Jesus, 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 we thank you for your blood. We thank you for who you are, God. We thank you that you are teaching us, that you are helping us, that you are strengthening us. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would just step in where we are weak. And God, all of us know that there's many places where we are weak. So God, we thank you that you gave us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and empower us and allow us to live out a God-like life, an abundant life here on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, so I'm still preaching, so we got this. As someone who likes to eat, I love that the first thing that God did was not deal with him spiritually. How many of you guys see that in that passage? Let's throw that back up there if it's not, um, where it says he got up and ate. Okay, good, we're good there. You can go back there to verse 8. I love that. I love that the angel of the Lord noticed how, how hurt, how malnourished, how uh, physically weak Elijah was, and he didn't say, hey, get your mind right get up. He said, Elijah, I care about you. Like, like I see physically that you are out of energy, that you do not have enough strength in your body to actually mentally even talk about the problems that you're going through. So he said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with the first thing that's at hand. Many times we have to physically be well before we can emotionally or spiritually be well. Yeah, and I think it's interesting, too, you're joking about, like, the different places that you, he could have eaten, the foods, the kind of foods. But there's actually enough sustenance for him and what God gave to him that he could do a 40-day, 40 40-night 40 journey. That's pretty wild, too, that he was filled up enough, he was strengthened enough, even just in his body, um, that God did that for him. Yeah, so God didn't deal with him spiritually or rebuke him or put a dream in his heart right away. Those were not the things that God did and say, he didn't say, Elijah, you're wrong. You shouldn't have been scared. He didn't say, Elijah, get up and uh, go face your challenges. He didn't say, Elijah, start dreaming again. When he realized that Elijah couldn't even walk or move because he was so 
malnourished. Yeah. He allowed him to eat and sleep, and then eat and sleep. Mm-hmm. You see a pattern here? Sometimes we need to eat and sleep. Can I get a good amen today? <laughs> amen. Sometimes we need to <laughs> eat and sleep. The Bible says he was strengthened by that food for the next step in the journey. Yeah, so sometimes you got to do the practical before you can do the thing that you want to do or that God's calling you to do. Yeah. Sometimes you got to take care of the next step before you can see the whole thing. Before we can deal with a problem, we must be healthy enough to deal with that problem. Many of us just need our lives healthy again. For some of us, that is getting some sleep, taking a vacation, or a real Sabbath. We talked about this in part one of our series. Like, you need to rest. You are not God, and even God did rest, and he does rest every seventh day. It's actually part of who he is, because in that number seven, it was a completion moment. He was able to inhale and exhale completion. Most of us don't stop to inhale or exhale. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So we're going to talk about some uh, key questions before we even like jump into how to get out of the cave. We're going to start looking at our foundation, how to build our house strong this Sunday. Um, But the key, we want to do some key questions to help you assess where you are in your life. So they're they're going to pop up, but then they're going to stay on screen. So at the end, if you want to screenshot it, um, you definitely can. Or take notes. I mean, as you write it down, we know that that's more powerful. But these are things that I use. I'm trying to get Pastor Sarah to use. (laughs) But these are things that we can look at our own lives and say, hey, how are we doing? Yeah. How am I doing? And not only that, I can take these questions to somebody else who trusts me, who believes in me, who wants God's best for me, and they can tell me, man, you're missing it here. Yeah. And it's a good indicator that something is off in your life. Yeah, it's so easy to do that, like, with our jobs. Like, there are goals we set. There are certain things you have to do by a certain time frame, you know, that kind of stuff. But it, it's we never think about doing it, like, in our own personal lives. Yeah, or for yeah. our family or yeah. kids or <laughs> anything else. <laughs> So here's a good one. The first one is, how's my faith life? I would write that down. How's my faith life? What does this mean? How is just me and Jesus? Not Pastor Spencer, not Spencer the pastor, not reading the Bible for the the church or those watching online. How am I doing with my personal walk with God? Am I spending time with him just to get to know him, just to spend time with him? Yeah. The next one is how is, if you're married, our marriage, like really how are we doing as well as any other relationships you have in your life, whether it's family or friends. So how are those relationships in my life? Yeah, the, the important relationships to you, of course, not maybe not if you have coworkers you don't like yes. or, you know, some students who are hating on you if you're a teacher, any of that. Like I'm talking about those that actually matter to you, yes. that if they said something mean to you or hurtful to you, it would probably take a little while to get over it, right? Like how are yeah. those relationships? Yeah. Um, the third one is how is my job? So what, what does that look like? Am I satisfied? Do I feel purpose in my job? Am I excited to get up in the morning or do I dread it? Is, is there, um, you know, like another pillow? If I can get like 10 more minutes of sleep, can I get your pillow, babe, because it's cold? Can I just like not get up today and just lay here? If that's how you're feeling, maybe you should look at that job situation of yours. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, the next one is digital use. What is your screen time like? Of course, if you work online, I'm not like counting that, but outside of work, because there's so many people who work remotely now, but how is your personal screen time? What is it like? How many hours a night do you spend watching shows instead of doing something else? How many hours a night do you uh, pull out your phone and scroll through social media? Um, and then how is that affecting your heart? Is it good or bad and then the last thing of course is uh what are you looking at as in like shielding your eyes as in is it an immoral thing is it something that you should be looking at is it something that you should be guarding your heart against we all know like you don't even have to be trying to look for something right (laughs) gentlemen can i get an amen ladies can i get an amen You, you don't even have to be trying to look for something inappropriate and it will pop up and so what things are in place to guard you against those situations. And again, like Sarah's saying, you know, sometimes you just pick up your phone and you just rabbit trail. Like you look at reels for 45 minutes, TikTok for an hour. You know, it's just like, and I don't even say hi to my wife. I don't even call my friends. I don't even ask them how they're doing. Like, you know, the people that actually matter to me, one day 
this thing is going to be but nothing. But those relationships that mattered so much to you, but this took up all that time, how are those things looking in your life? My next question for you is my time use. How does my schedule look? We talked about it last week. Do you schedule in your time with God in your calendar? Do you actually put God first in everything? Like most of us have a Google calendar, an Apple calendar, but many of us are not putting our time with God in our calendar. And then we just find every reason in the book to not do it because it's not there. It's not important. The next one that can be a huge, huge, you all know, uh, uh, stress factor in mental health is finances. How are my finances? What am I doing with my finances? Am I using what God is giving me wisely? Am I stewarding it well? That is the next big, big thing is looking at finances because that is a big, sometimes red flag in mental health because of um, the situations that we can find ourselves in that are so many of the time out of our control and so much of the time there are things that are in our control. So what can I give to God and ask him to help me with because it's not in my control like he talked about last week? And what can I do to set some boundaries, set some parameters, do some budgeting or whatever to get some things that I do have in my control in my control? Yeah. And of course, within that, right, is is God first in your finances? You're going to hear us say that like every time here at this church because Again, if God isn't first over everything in your life, then something else is. Period. It's just the, it's just the truth of the matter. Um, so the next one is, how are my other relationships? So these are my secondary relationships for some. These are friendships. Maybe some of your friendships were in that first category. Um, but these could be your, your coworkers. These could be, um, you know, second cousins, third cousins. If you're in Umatilla, it could be first family and second family. You never know. So those watching in Lake County, all, all the same, right? Um, but we love everybody. So the reality is, is how are the other relationships in your life? Have you completely written them off? Or is there still some interaction you have with them? Are they healthy interactions? Um, maybe these are aunts and uncles. Maybe these are, these are people in your life that you see maybe once or twice a year on holidays and that's it. But how are those relationships doing? Yeah. And the next is attitude. How's my attitude? How are my emotions? Like, how am I feeling? Am I short with people? Quick and angry? Uh, it doesn't take me very long to jump down somebody's neck. And, you know, and then afterwards, you're like, why in the world did I do that? Passive aggressive. Uh-huh. Are you passive aggressive with everyone you talk to? Uh-huh. So, Always making jokes, but really meaning something behind it, you know, yeah, like, how yeah. are you treating people? Yeah, that's a that's a big one that can be a red flag or a trigger that something else is going on, underlying going on that's deeper. If you, if you are feeling like these are shots fired at you, <laughs> they are not. <laughs> these is, this is just a good list. Um, so the next one, this is a big one, and a lot of us in here, I see slings, I see boots, I see, I know there's back surgeries and titanium and metal and, and all of us in this place and different things happen in our life. A lot of this is out life. of our control. But, but number nine is. is my body, how healthy am I? Right? This can be both mentally, emotionally, and physically, right? So we have to look at the physical state of our body. If our body is yelling at us and telling us there's issues, then maybe we should slow down. We need to take a break. We need to do some other things, right? And, and get centered with God and with ourselves so that we can grow and we can go to the next level and all these other things can work well together. If your body is yelling at you and you can't even think because you're in so much pain, you're not able to even think about all this other stuff, so... And then the last one is, how's my soul? How's my soul? So the soul is defined as the mind, will, and emotions. So right now, it's how is your soul currently? What is going on in your life right now? What are the things that we need to look at? Dr. Henry Cloud says there is a way to build your emotional house. If built the right way, it will prepare you for adversity, change the ups and downs of life if we prepare our emotional house. And we know that a house is built, so um, and we know how it is. So that's kind of what we're going to use as an illustration today in the building of our emotional house and getting ourselves a firm foundation and all the wonderful things that then come next so that when the storms of life hit, we are definitely ready to handle them and we're not shaken, absolutely shaken. And I love alliteration, so I'm going to make it real easy for you. Everybody say three Fs. Three Fs. Foundation. Foundation. Framing. Framing. 
Furnishings. That's what we're going to look at today. How is our emotional house built on the foundation, the framing, the furnishings? Even a physical house is typically built in a similar structure pattern, right? So let's see what God's Word says. We're going to read Matthew 7, 24 and 25. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man. Everybody say wise man. Wise man. Or wise woman. Woman. Okay, only one. <laughs> Who built his house on the rock? The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Amen, amen. I think I used this main verse when we were doing a, um, like, a, like a foundation of like making Christ your foundation too. So it's a good, good verse. It's powerful. You can use it in a lot of ways because in the original language, it actually had several different meanings. Um, I love this one talking about how it uh, forms our, our emotions. So what is your soul made up of? The first one is foundation. Your foundation is determined by your relationships and your connectedness. So your relationships to others and how connected you actually are. We saw this in the middle of COVID when we were encouraged by for viral reasons to socially distance. Oh, so horrible. So horrible. <laughs> they, they meant what? They didn't mean socially distance. They meant physically, physically distance. distance. That was the point. And so they really wanted physical distance to take place. We needed social connection more than ever in those moments. Yes. And so a lot of the repercussions of what our world is facing right now is due to the fact that many of us not only physically distant distanced ourselves from one another, but we also socially distanced ourselves from one another. It's like they mislabeled it on purpose. <laughs> well, I, I hope not to think that way, but at the same time, you can't help but wonder with the rising mental health crisis that we see in America, if there was not some kind of impact, and we know that there was, I mean, you would even see people Zooming with a mask on, yeah. right? Like you were, you were states away and you had your mask on in your house, in your, in your room, not around anybody else. And people were wearing a mask here and a mask on the other side of the computer. I saw people completely alone in a car, like driving a car alone with a mask on. Oh man, like it's probably just was a habit. Like I just left it on and I forgot. And if I turn around and be like, why yeah. are they in a mask in their car alone? And I want to encourage you that today you need social connection now more than ever. Like honestly, you must be socially Amen. connected to people that matter to you. When isolated, some professors say your IQ can drop up to 30 points. I don't know about you, <laughs> but most of us can't afford to lose any of our IQ points. So can I get a good amen on that? Like most of us cannot afford to lose 30 points of our, our, our IQ, sorry. Meaning you are, not, you are not yourself. If this change takes place, when you lose those IQ points, you literally are no longer yourself. Creates you a fog maybe? A, a different person. Yeah. The first problem in the Bible wasn't sin, it was solitude. Oh, this when he was working on these notes, I was like, what, what? Most people say the biggest issue is sin because it separated us from God. But the sin didn't take place until there was solitude. Solitude was the problem that God called out in the beginning. Yeah, he said, it's not good for man to be alone. That was the first problem. God's like, I got to handle this. There's something wrong with this. Thanks for stealing my scripture. So good. Genesis 2.18. <laughs> the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. <laughs> it's the word of God, it's right? My thank you, thank part. you. Ecclesiastes 4 8 says this There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil. He had neither son nor brother. And, and in the original translation, that doesn't just mean like he had no males in his life, it, right. it's meaning he had nobody in his life, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. So it's also saying he had no one in his life, but he was really rich, and it didn't matter. Yeah. You're physically close, but socially distant. This generation has almost fostered that with this thing. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't want to, like, I'm in that generation, so right. I'm speaking to myself that I could go on every single person's phone in here right now and tell you how many hours you spend on social media, yeah. right? And, and it's probably more like, hours uh, upon hours upon hours and, and very little amount of time actually spent talking to people. This generation has fostered that. It can be so far from social. 
Like, social media can be so far yeah. removed from social. Connectedness is what grounds us. Connect how? The Bible tells us that we need to connect with God through worship and prayer, which we already got to do, and we should be doing that every day. Connect with God's people, intentionally connecting with those who put life back in you. So we can be so quick in church to say, I don't like this. You hurt my feelings when you said this. That person looked at me wrong. Maybe the coffee wasn't good enough today. Um, maybe, maybe Rich tried to trip me when, he, when he, I came in this morning or, you know, whatever the case is. But the reality is we should be gathering for what? To strengthen one another. And sometimes strengthening happens when we don't agree. Yeah, I literally, guys, this is like a true story. I was the church that I would grew up in. Um, we were married. We were uh, we were youth pastors doing the whole thing. And I had this lady come up to me after service. I've never had anything like this happen in my life. And she was like, um, "I need to talk to you." And I was like, "Okay, sure." I have never talked to this woman in my life, but I knew she was a regular attendee of the church. I knew who she was. She goes, "I don't understand what your problem is with me." And I was like, "What?" <laughs> I like start getting like red slowly. Like I'm so embarrassed. I'm like, "What?" And she's like, "Why do you always give me the dirtiest looks every Sunday?" I'm like, "Oh my god." I'm like, I am so sorry. I'm like, maybe I have RBF. I'm not going to say what that is, but I'm like, maybe I have RBF. Like, I'm like, I'm just, I don't know. I'm thinking, I'm worshiping. I'm like, I am sorry if I came across like that. I was so embarrassed, but I felt so uncomfortable. And literally, like, she just took offense to something. I promise you, I didn't know her at all. I didn't know her from Adam. And she uh, was upset enough that she came to me to ask me what issue with. It's like, man, man, sometimes people just, yeah, it creates things, insecurities in their hearts or things they've got going on. And they're just in this place where they're looking. Someone must not like me. Someone must be out to get me. Um, and they're just feeling so disconnected that they're creating creating things that aren't even really there. Yeah, you can you can create social barriers even physically in person. Yeah. Does that make sense like like she's saying you can put a wall up in front of somebody because they looked at you wrong. Yeah. Maybe, you know, maybe they hurt your feelings. Maybe, you know, they're not a Gator fan. So <laughs> like I can't I can't talk to the Seminole people in here. So like we create barriers all the time. Let's stop creating them in church between one another, because social isolation is really hurting us. Yeah. So the first is foundation. So number two now is framing. So framing. After the foundation of a house goes down and they lay all that fun, interesting stuff that I know nothing about in the concrete, then they start building a frame. Then they start building a frame. So the frame, if you're taking notes, is purpose and routines. Two things, purpose and routine. This, this one right here will set you free yes. if you let it. Like so I'm telling you, we purpose, struggled with this. Purpose defines your life, right? That's what we hear so many people struggling with, especially as you're coming out of um, college or coming out of high school, going into college. Like, what is my purpose in life? What am I supposed to do for my whole life? And a lot of you know that you have had different seasons in your life right? Where your purpose should always hopefully run true through it, but you're doing it in a different way or you're doing something new. And so purpose and structure around time can calm people's minds. So purpose and structure are super important. Structure is putting things into place that help you either get into a weekly rhythm or get into something that becomes really foundational to what holds your walls up and keeps the roof over your head. The more routine you have in your life, it actually releases, they found, healthy hormones that can bring calm to your brain. Because you know how many of you like to multitask. I do it all the time. I'm not giving 100% attention to one thing, so I feel like I'm accomplishing more. I have a love-hate relationship with it because a lot of times I feel like I'm killing it and <laughs> I'm multitasking. And a lot of times I feel like I absolutely got nothing done. <laughs> so the more 
a structure you have, it helps and provides room that you can dream again. You can dream about purpose. You can dream about things that you want to do. You know what's coming next. And so you can start to plan for maybe asking and inviting God into to see yeah. what's next. This is because you actually have margin in your life usually. Yes, margin. Because That's if you're just one. like jumping from thing to thing to thing to thing, and you, you have no order, no structure, nothing in your life. You have nothing that says, hey, I'm actually done with everything that I want to get done today. But if you have structure, you know, like, hey, this is task one, task two, task three, on and on, however many you have. And when I'm done, I know, man, now I have free time, whether that's just to be alone with God or be alone with myself or dream, whatever that is, I have margin in my life. We decided to do this as a family. It's something that we try to do that we are not great at, but we always try to have some kind of, I know people like made fun of us before for it. We had like to have an evening schedule. Like Monday nights, we, you know, exercise. Tuesday nights, we will watch TV. Wednesday nights, we read and study for a sermon. But we just find we would have this time where we'd put our kiddo to sleep and then we just sit on the couch and just watch something for for two, two and a half hours before we went to bed. And we were just finding, like, why are we so still exhausted at the end of the day? Why do we feel like we're not accomplishing anything? Why do we feel like we're not talking and getting to know each other and learning where we're at emotionally? We'd have these big blow-ups, and I'd be like, I don't know you felt that way. He'd be like, why don't you just ask me to talk? And I'm like, I don't know. I thought everything was good. So there's all these things that when you actually try to put in a little bit of schedule, you find this freedom and this connectedness in your life because because there is margin and there's time structured in. So one study says you can reboot your emotions by establishing new routines. Seems simple enough. You guys know if you've ever worked with childcare, with special needs um, people, or with um, senior citizens that are maybe in like a retirement home or something, routine is everything. <laughs> if you mess up that routine, it's like, wah! Like, whoa, what did I do? And that's because we're just wired, and that doesn't exclude us from it. We should be too, because we are really, really healthy off that. Doesn't mean that if you like to go off the cuff and that's your thing, that you can't, you know, pick a trip and, you know, throw a dart at a map or something like that. Still, if that fuels you to do stuff that way, that's awesome. But there are some things in our life that should be routine that we get used to and we know is coming. Yeah, your life can't be chaos, right? Like, God is not a God of chaos, and so therefore we are created in his image and likeness. So if we are chaotic in our life and there's no structure and no routines, at the same time, we're going to have that chaos in yeah. our life. And we're not we, created for that. We personally are like literally in the throes, like in the middle of trying to figure this out in our own life because we both are working multiple part-time jobs and we have the toddler and uh, the church. So there's a lot going on. And so we are speaking out of this from a place of like we right now are even still working but on what, this in our lives. But what happened a week ago when we created new routines? Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. We, we felt a weight lifted off of our shoulders, yeah. not like man, how's all this stuff going to work together? Yeah. Because we hadn't even talked about it, but then we talked about it, and there was a weight that was lifted off of our shoulders. So it's cool, and I love that that quote that it creates or reboots our emotions. Yeah. That's really neat. So let's back this up with Scripture because we just told you a bunch of, like, things that you should do. But Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. So where there is no purpose in your life, no looking towards a goal or something next, asking God to come alongside you, do something exciting, open your heart for something awesome. What is the next cool thing I get to serve in or the next uh, person I get to help? What is the purpose and the vision? And then Psalm 126, 1 through 2 says, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths are filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Awesome. Talk about like uh, uplifting. It was time to dream again, to have joy. Dream in the Hebrew um, that's used there in the original language, it means to be healthy, to be strong, and to restore health, which is really interesting, right? You wouldn't think that's what the word dream meant, but that's what it means. Do you dream? Anyone in here actually like have dreams for their life still? Yes, yes. Some hands didn't yes. go up. So I, I would love for every hand in here eventually and, and those watching online to feel like there's a dream that God has placed in their heart. 
It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how much time you have left on this earth. There is a dream to be placed in your heart, whether that's for the next generation, for yourself, for somebody around you. But I mean, because when we dream, we become healthy. We become strong, the word says. And this is all, once again, just helping us get out of that cave. Um, So we need to remind ourselves of our purpose today, not just that I have a job, but I'm on a mission, even in my workplace, even in the grocery store, even in my home and with my family. I have a vision for my family, my marriage, my kids, and my family. I have somewhere I'm going because that really helps when you're struggling mentally. It helps you to look towards something else because it gets you out of the spot you're emotionally in right now. And it helps you look towards something in the future that I have a future and it's bright. Yeah. yeah. So the last part of, of this uh, house, the emotional house that we're building is the finishes. Number three is the finishes. Um, how many of you can say that when people talk to you, they have a problem with your attitude? They think you like at some point in your life, they've, they've thought you were angry. They thought you didn't like them. They thought, you know, maybe you were bossy. emotionally distant. You didn't talk. You were bossy. You were mean. You were always upset. So the finishes are the opposite of that. These are the things that are going to help you to beautify your emotions, meaning that people are going to be attracted to you if we do these things. Um, So the first one is finishes look like trust and self-control. Trust and self-control. So we make our emotional house beautiful when we trust God for what we can't control and we take control for that which we can control. I'll say it one more time. I know that's a lot of control. We make our emotional house beautiful when we trust God for what we can't control. So the things we have nothing to do with, we, we, we can't impact one way or the other. And we take control for what, for that, which we can control the things that we can actually change. We own them, right? We say, Hey, Phyllis, I can get up in the morning and I can go for a walk. Right. Amen. <laughs> right. I have I have control over that. But what so and so chooses to think about me at work tomorrow, I have no control over what they think about me. So I'm going to think this way. This is the difference between a fact of life, something that is solid and sure and a problem. And I love this this juxtaposition here because a fact of life I cannot impact, but a problem I can change or I can solve. Or I can get help to solve it, right? This is that line that I found and I still struggle with, but that so many people struggle with, especially in the Bible and the teaching and the Bible is, okay, what is faith versus me moving? Like, when do I trust God for this situation? But when is he asking me to take the next step? I love that this is a great way to break it down and know the difference because so many of my times in my life, I'm like praying to get a piece about something. I'm praying to get a piece about something, but am I supposed to be like walking through the door that he already opened? I don't know. (laughs) And this is a great way to do that. Or is it something he's already given you the answer to in his word? True. Right? (laughs) Like sometimes we pray about things, but the answer is already right here. Yeah. And so guess what? Our God's not changing the answer that's already right here because he's already given Giving it to us, we just have to open it up and see it and take it in. So, a problem is something you can fix. A fact of life does not change no matter the effort. So, this is a good way of looking at these two things because a problem is something I can fix. Trust is this giving up control of that which I can't control. Trust is giving up control of that which I can't control. Amen. You, you got to trust your spouse. Can I get a good amen? Yes. You amen. can't control your spouse. <laughs> or you shouldn't even try because if you've done it for any Don't length of bad. time, yeah, it doesn't work out very well. Maybe someone's more dominant in the relationship, and, and that's great. But do not dominate, dominate your spouse. I, I encourage you today, that is not the way of doing things. You have to trust your spouse, right? There's a healthy level here. Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Amen. Amen. Self-control is this, taking control of what I can control, right? So self-control means when I go to the buffet, I'm not going to get up eight different times. I'm going to get up twice 
and maybe third time and get the dessert, but <laughs> even some of the time, we probably should leave the third one alone. Maybe when we go hang out with people, it doesn't mean even though I already had dinner, but they're having pizza, babe. Can I eat pizza too, like later tonight? I mean, at some point, self-control. Why is self-control always around weight? Can you guys figure this out yet? Like the reality is, but that has to do with our physical bodies, right? And how we feel and how we see ourselves. And I can tell you personally, like last time I got on a scale, I didn't like it. You may not say, think that about me, but I, I didn't like what that number read. And so I know that there's areas in my life where self-control is important. Same thing, like, you know, we, sometimes we get prideful and we think we can do everything in our own strength. And sometimes we should have some self-control and wait and see that thing through by the help of another or, you know, maybe just be more patient or take your time, whatever that is. Yeah, and I'm speaking about that right now because I have a great visual aid on my foot today. Um, that's how that happened. I was, I was prideful thinking I was going to get everything done on my own. And bam, I was down and out and broke my foot. So I fully understand these situations. But self-control is taking control of what I can control. All your ways, the Bible says, to acknowledge him. In all your ways. How many of your ways? Thank you. So that was a little slow on this side. How many of your ways are you supposed to acknowledge him? Aww. Okay, there we go. So in every single way, we're supposed to acknowledge God, even when things aren't going good. So we need to make some choices. We need to hang out with the right people. And we need to do things that give ourselves life. Dr. George Amen. Crane says this, the psychologist, he said, motions are the precursors to emotions. Y'all, that's much better than I'm getting from the crowd today. <laughs> motions, how we move, are the precursors to emotions. What we do and do not do impact our emotional state of mind and our physical body all at the same time. And this is from a world-renowned psychologist. Motions are the precursors to emotions. The right steps can affect how I feel. Trust is the hard one for the type A leader, the control freak. Can I get an amen? Those of us that say, I want everything in my life. I, I want to know A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. I want to know how all my bills are paid. I want to know all of this stuff. Like there's nothing wrong in and of itself with that, but to think you have all power over every situation is going to leave you in a bad emotional place. Definitely, definitely. So I'm just going to kind of leave off with this, uh, what I think is an amazing tool, and you have probably heard it um, before, um, but maybe you haven't uh, heard of it like as the name, but it's... Uh, the full, the full yeah, prayer. Yeah, this is the full one. So this is the serenity prayer by, oh man, y'all, is it Reinhold Niebuhr? I don't know. Reinhold Niebuhr, yeah. I didn't know that there was like a writer of it. It makes sense that there is. But so the serenity prayer is, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Amen. That's a good one. It's long. There's so much Jesus in it, though. And it's just so awesome um, to think that is exactly what we're talking about. There are things that we can change. There are things that we can do that are in our control. I don't want to get to heaven and be like, God, I was so stressed out. And I was da 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 da. I'm like, why did you do this? Da, da, da. And he'd be like, I gave you every opportunity. It was your turn to take it. It was your turn to take it. So I want to be able, um, grant me the wisdom to know the difference of the things that I can give to God. Shelter that burden. Let him have it. Let him carry it. Even in the things that we, I do want to say, even in the things that we are working in, that we are taking step towards, do that and then give it to God too. You don't have to carry that too. <laughs> you know, you have that um, 
meeting with that person and you did the best you can and you give it to God. You have that situation happen in your relationship and you pray for that person and you give it to God, right? Those are the the great steps in that and the things that we give to him fully that we can't touch, things that we can, we still should at the end and give it to him. Yeah. Anything else you want to say? Yeah, I just, I love that last um, part of that prayer it says so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next Woo-hoo. always looking towards that so reasonable happiness would just simply mean doing what we just talked about right like having self-control of the things that I can't control in my life and trusting God for the things that I don't have control in right and I said it at the beginning, I said it in the, in the prayer I did in our ministry moment, but most of us think God is in control of everything. And that's a, that's a hard pill to swallow, right? You've heard the word sovereignty before. God is sovereign, but C.S. Lewis says this, that in his sovereignty, God gave us free will. And so I think that as, as we look at these things, many of us want to say, man, God, just fix it. Just do the thing. Do the work. Make me healthy. Give me the job. Right? Open the door. Bring the people. But there's things that are within our control, and then there's things that are not. And so some of those things have factors, right? Like, you rarely are going to get a job you don't apply for right? You rarely are going to see people in church you didn't invite. Rarely. These are just truths, right? Like they say 85% of people that show up to church come because you invited them. A person in the church invited them. And these are just things that we know that if we can do them, if we can invite, if we can reach, if we can ask, if we can trust God for the things that we need to trust him with, our happiness level supremely goes up. Right? When we start to say, God, here, I did my inviting, now I trust you with the rest. I applied for that job, I trust you with the rest. I'm eating healthy, I'm exercising, I trust you with the rest. Right? Like all of these things work hand in hand, and I hope you see like there's a part you have to play. You can't always be like, man, every job sucks. I'm getting fatter. Nobody comes. Right? Like these are all things that we deal with in our life, right? And if I just say that, God, why don't you do something? No matter how hard I yell, no matter how hard I cry, it's not going to change. Because there's a part we have to play, and that's the unique dichotomy that God has given us in this world. That we are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Like he didn't say, I sent my my son, I sent the Holy Spirit, and now I'm going to send something else. No, he put his Holy Spirit in you. And so all of these things, you have a part to play. Amen, amen. So we are so excited as I close. I'm going to do salvation prayer like we usually do. Um, but I'm so excited about next week. Um, we This was a little bit about of kind of, okay, you're in the cave assessing it, and now let's start the, 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 the work, but the not work, of getting out and uh, doing something. And then um, my dad is actually going to be here preaching Guest next week. Guest preacher Woo-hoo. in the house So we're next super, week. super excited. He's going to be up here preaching, and he is going to be talking from a real honest raw place of mental health that he's in right now and he is going to be talking about what you need to do to get out as in I know it's um I think it's two main things are surrounding yourself with the right people and not isolating and then something else um so we're super super excited about that um he has been prayerfully considering this message for a very long time and uh, so I know it's going to be definitely definitely powerful so this uh, series will end with that it's been an awesome one and we're just so thankful that you've been along with us for it um and then fifth sunday serve sunday yeah so we're excited about that too focusing on people all right so uh if you could go ahead and stand with me as we close um we're just gonna do uh, a salvation prayer for anybody in person or online that feels like um they are just lost and they are looking for this jesus this savior that helps in so many ways and so we're just gonna uh, close our eyes and bow our heads and give anyone the opportunity 
opportunity online or in person to um, either ask Jesus into their hearts for salvation for the first time or to renew their relationship with Jesus Christ. And so go ahead and lift your hands if you would like to pray that. And then we are going to pray that all together. Thank you. So if you would just repeat after me as we pray this as one body of Christ. Dear Lord, I need you. I give the things in my life up to you that I need to give. I accept your son Jesus as Lord of my life. I am done doing it on my own. Please come into my heart. Amen. Amen. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, we always celebrate that, whether it's online or in person. I want to tell you guys that over the last few weeks, like Easter, Mother's Day, we've had 10 salvations in Story Woo-hoo! Church. In the past so month. That is super so exciting, exciting for guests and people recommitting their lives to Christ, like what you are doing here on a Sunday and those that pray for us regularly, it is worth it. Mm-hmm. Because that's 10 people that are in heaven and not in hell because of what Story Church is doing Amen. and what so God good. is doing Thank in you. this place. So we're excited yeah. about that. We're going to close with our um, tithes and offerings like we always do. Um, there will be a bucket in the back, but you can also give up here. Um, I do strongly encourage you, of course, if this is your church, to participate in giving. If it is not your church, that's okay too. We understand and we don't want anyone to feel like that they are called or that they have to do it, but we do want people to know that it does delight the heart of God when you give out of a joyful heart. And so also that that money is going into the community and impacting the kingdom. We got to, as Sarah said earlier, we got to go to the Mobile Hope Center this week, and that was super powerful. We got to reach people um, who needed food, who needed uh, counseling, who needed health care, and we were a part of that. Yeah. So we're we excited to, to partner. We partnered yeah. with them financially as well. Yep. We so we're going to pray over those finances. Yes. Dear Lord, we thank right. you for those finances. God, we pray that in every person's life, anyone who um, is facing a wall or a barrier right now, that as they are able to release least finances into the kingdom, God, that they would see miracles in their Amen. own personal you, finances. Lord. God, that there would be a change, that there would be clear open doors, and God, that you would just pour out a blessing on their lives. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. 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 You guys have a wonderful week. Bye-bye. Have a great week, guys.